Yeah, so to me, looking at the potential of what, let's say, genomic engineering, what it could do in comparison to what the Artelex could become, then the, the Artelex potential is just so many orders of magnitude superior that, that it forces me to the conclusion that genomic engineering is just chicken feed. It's small beer. So I'm, you know, I look down. I look down on that stuff. When, for example, when I hear uh, people saying that the 20th century was like the century of physics, and the 21st century will be the century of biology, I don't buy that at all. I, I don't think physics has really come into its own yet. I mean, when when we have quantum computers and topological quantum computers, and and maybe femtotech. When we, when we have uh, now, now this is sounding like science fiction, but but the potential's there. See it, see it coming. Uh, you've heard of electronics and you know, all the technology that came out of that, which is just playing around with electrons. Well, try and imagine some kind, and, and this is where it sounds like science fiction. But imagine some kind of gluonics. You know, what what's the gluon? Well, it's the kind of particle. It's the kind of force particle that bonds, binds, quarks. So imagine some Fermi scale. A Fermi is a thousandth of a trillionth of a meter. It's, it's a, 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 a femtometer. So imagine a, a technology at that scale where, where you're just playing around putting quarks together using, using gluonics. Imagine, imagine what you could do with such a technology. It, it would be a trillion, trillion times more powerful than nanotech, because it's a million times smaller, right? So, so purely in terms of dens density, you know, how many um, Fermi-type particles, uh, components could you have in, in a unit space? So you've got a, a million that way, a million that way, and a million that way, right? So a million cubed, so you've got a, you've got a million, million, million times greater number of components in, in a unit space. And those components signal to each other a million times faster because they've hit the scale a million times smaller. So the distances between two of them is like a million times smaller. So you, you have to multiply by another million to get the total performance. Right? So the, the density is a million cubed times another million for the speed. So you end up with a trillion, trillion times greater performance of Fermi-tech or Femto-tech compared to nanotech. So this, you know, this is all physics. I mean, this is one of the research projects I've set myself now is to try and find um, phenomena at a Femto or Fermi scale that maybe get used as the basis, the physics basis, for a Fermi-tech or Femto-tech. Right? So that's that's basic physics and it's so potentially faster than, than biology that I get extremely skeptical when, when I hear these guys saying that you know, this, this is a century of biology. Now, of course there will be major progress in biology. We'll understand how the brain works. You know, big, big deal. And it is. Understand what consciousness is even. Maybe. Maybe. And all, you know, all that gets into the you know, neuroengineering, and all that's great, fine. But it's still chicken feed compared to the potential of physics. I don't, I don't see anything undermining physics. It's just too basic. It's too fundamental. It, it, it's the foundation of everything. It's the fundamental science. So, so when these biologists sort of wave the biological flag, I just sort of. I look on them like children, <laughs> so, uh, but that's just my personal bias. Right? I, I, I see physics as fundamental. Well, you've mentioned um, topological quantum computers um, and the missing ideon that people are looking for. Can you discuss where we're at with topological quantum computing and when you, the horizon? 
advise it on when you see um, somebody discovering an anion which will be able to be used as a substrate for quantum computing or be able to use to make it work in some way? Okay, so I see uh, an intimate link between quantum computing and, and artifacts. I, I see these, these artifacts will be, you know, the technology they will use will, will be quantum computing. I'll just I'll stop you there, just one second. If quantum computing is so fast, and you've got you know a massive sort of bus speed in order to play with any with these anions, it gives you maybe you know 128 lanes to sort of go at each sort of quantum step. Um, does that mean that you'll then be able to evolve an, an artificial intelligence in hardly any time? Like I mean, the quicker the quicker. So once you get there, you 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 pretty much got a singularity. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, one of if, if you look at the major difference between quantum computing and classical computing, like, like this laptop that I have in front of me is a, a classical computer. Essentially, it can only do one thing at a time. Right? It, it has well, no, has one processor in it. So you know, data comes in and they get processed. You know, one one computer instruction gets executed at a time. And then the result goes out, goes back to central memory, the, the von Neumann classical computer architecture. But when quantum computers uh, uh, become scalable and robust, and, and, and where the number of bits that you can have, or quantum bits or qubits, uh, when, when, when the number of those that you can handle uh, robustly, without them being fragile to local disturbance, and that's been, been that, that robustness problem, uh, the technical term for it is decoherence. So the decoherence problem, uh, meaning the, the local disturbance yeah. which destroys the, the storage of information at tiny, tiny you know, quantum level scales. And Tamaroff's idea about consciousness. So uh, once, once topological quantum computers come into existence, then quantum computing becomes robust. Right? You, you, don't, you don't have this decoherence problem because effectively what you're doing is you're storing that information in, in a kind of spread out way. So if there's some local disturbance interaction here, it doesn't matter because that, the information that before got disturbed, lost, well, it, does, it doesn't get disturbed because it's sort of the, the information spread out in, in something called a topological quantum field. Right? I mean, it's, this is a crude analogy, but imagine you're storing information on the number of holes in a, in a surface. Like, like, like if you take an ordinary donut with a hole, one hole, and imagine that donut, it's not made of flour, but it's made of soft rubber, imagine. And you, you take that donut and you twist it and you squash it and you stretch it. And so all, all its uh, surface properties and angles and lengths, all, all that changes. But some topological property does not change unless you cut, and that is number of holes. Right? That 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 becomes a topological invariant, meaning does not change. Right? So if you can somehow store information using topologically invariant properties in some topological quantum field, well, then it becomes much more robust. Right? And, and this is this is what's coming. So to make that idea work, and the idea itself dates, what, it's 13 years old now, 97, some Russian guy, Katayev, his name was, uh, had this idea. Hey, do quantum computing using topological quantum fields. So, uh, so imagine that uh, that comes into being, and how far away is it? Well, to, to be able to use that idea, you have to have phenomena in physics that, that are topological quantum fields. Right? Now the first, the first one to be discovered is uh, 2005, so only five years ago, and uh, it's, it's a, an any on, any as in it can have any spin. So it's, it's these sort of quasi particles that exist in, in like a two-dimensional surface inside silicon at extreme cold, like, like milli, milli Kelvin, you know, almost at absolute zero, just a few thousandths of a degree above milli, you know, zero, absolute zero. So milli Kelvin, 
an extremely strong uh, transverse, like here's, here's the 2D surface like this, and you have very powerful magnetic fields this way. So under these extreme circumstances, very high magnetic fields and extreme cold, then the, the electrons in that surface, they can travel this way, that way, but they can't travel up, right? Because the, the size of the, the gap, the slice, this 2D surface, it's so tiny that they, the electrons can't move up. So they're sort of stuck in, in a two-dimensional world. They're, they're, they're like two-dimensional creatures. But um, under such extreme magnetic fields and temperatures, so low, the electrons start behaving in, in really weird quantum ways. And they, they form into groups, sort of, I don't know, again, hundred, hundreds of billions of them, into quasi-particles. They behave as though they're like a particle, but in fact they're an agglomeration of zillions of electrons, right? And they're called enions because they have fractional charge of the electron and they have weird, weird properties. Right? And they're absolutely fascinating, the, the so-called um, condensed matter physicists, the people who study this weird, weird stuff. And it's, it's, it's you know, for theoretical and uh, observed phenomena, these, these enions have topological properties. So, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, so take, take two enions, and here, here's your 2D surface. And you just swap their positions, like this. And as, you look, as you look down on it, swapping them, that's clockwise, as I look at it. And if I swap them this way, that's anti-clockwise. Now, uh, well, the mathematics and the physics is the same whether I swap like this. Like, or the, the final state in, is the same. It's, it's quasi path independent. It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's like that or it's just like that. Oh, sorry, so I can get in the camera. So, are you, are you swapping them that way or are you just swapping them with a, like a little path? It's path independent. The only thing that's important is, did you swap them anti-clockwise or did you swap them clockwise? So this is a topological property. Okay? So if it's the same if you do that or that, then it doesn't matter if there's a bit of a disturbance, so, so the path gets jiggled a little bit, right? It doesn't matter. path doesn't matter. It's just the topological property. Did you swap clockwise or anti-clockwise? So, uh, now the first the first enion to be discovered, 2005, but it didn't quite have the properties that would allow universal computation. You could you could not compute anything. Right? So now the race is on in, in the condensed matter physics departments around the world to find the appropriate enion that can compute universally. And it, it can, it, you know, being used, it can, it can compute anything. So there could be more than one type of enion? Yeah, yeah, there's lots, there's lots. Right. But how do they know they exist? Well, there's, uh, the, the last decade or so, there's been a couple of Nobel Prizes won on, on a phenomenon inside physics, condensed matter physics, 